The story of Jesus' birth has a whole bunch of supporting characters besides Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. You have the Archangel Gabriel, you have bad guys like King Herod, but by far the weirdest supporting characters in my opinion are the three wise men. I mean, who are these guys? They come from the east following a star, they're bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's a weird story when you really think about it. And everyone seems to love them. Christmas pageants everywhere deck their kids out in crazy wise men costumes. They play a central role in the creepy little drummer boy TV special. And not only do they have their own famous Christmas carol, but they even have their own video game from the original Nintendo system. Though, I'm not really sure what this has anything to do with the original story. But what I find most interesting is not their role in the Christmas story, but their profession as astrologers and magicians, and what this meant for an ancient audience reading the story. So one of the biggest misconceptions about these guys is their name, We Three Kings, or The Three Wise Men. A bunch of Bible translations, including the King James Version, all use the term wise men, but the original Greek says nothing about wise men or kings. The text says Magoi from the east, commonly anglicized as Magi or Magi from the east. Magi, you know, the term where we get the word for mage or magician. Yeah, suddenly the story just got a whole lot weirder. But let's dive into what Magi really were in antiquity. The original term comes from the old Persian word for priest. And generally speaking, scholars agree that the Magi were the primary ritual specialists and temple functionaries of Persia, modern day Iran. Babylonian texts from the 5th century BCE talk about a group of priests called the Magi. And many Magi must have been followers of Zoroastrianism, which was the dominant religion of the time in that area. However, the category of Magi seems to have been pretty loose in antiquity. Whether all Magi were followers of Zoroastrianism or whether they were all part of the same hereditary caste of priest is not all that clear. And moreover, priest really doesn't do these guys justice. Many Magi must have been involved in politics or served as advisors to Persian rulers. One of the most famous Magi, a guy named Gaumata or Smyrtis, actually led a huge rebellion against the Persian Emperor Darius I, according to an old Persian inscription in Bisatun, Iran. The Greek historian Herodotus suggests that these guys had a whole range of duties, sacrificing to the gods, interpreting dreams, or telling the future, and it was these last two duties that were most famous among the Greeks. The Magi were known to be experts of astrology and divination, which kind of makes their story in the Gospel of Matthew, chasing a star, seem a little bit more clear. This is the kind of stereotype that ancient Greek audiences would have thought of when they thought about Magi. But what I find most interesting is that being a Magus was not really a respected profession in the Greco-Roman world. When the Greeks assimilated the word Magos into their language, it took on a more pejorative connotation, meaning sorcerer or magician. In fact, accusing someone of being a Magos was actually a huge deal because because he would have been viewed as a suspicious or dangerous member of society. In fact, the Roman writer Apuleius was arrested for being accused of being a Magos, apparently putting a curse on his wife to steal her fortune. For many earlier Greek authors like Sophocles, or later Christian authors like Clement of Alexandria, being a Magos means practicing Magia, a Greek word that they used to label any ritual that they thought was deviant or suspicious. Accusing someone of Magia means accusing them of practicing secret rituals at night, stealing body parts from the graves to use in their potions, and cursing helpless women and children. But was ancient magic really like this? Were magi basically sorcerers practicing weird deviant rituals? The archaeology of magic suggests that these accusations basically just amount to slanderous rhetoric. Most people had access to forms of magic and divination without being arrested like Apuleius. Hollywood too often influences our ideas of magic. But in the ancient Greco-Roman world, it was actually a relatively common practice for ritual specialists and priests, and it wasn't quite as fantastic as we might imagine. One of the most famous archaeologists logical finds, for example, is a divination kit found at the city of Pergamum in Asia Minor. The divination kit, which dates to the 3rd century CE, includes seven bronze objects and three stone amulets. Among the bronze items, there is a concave disc bearing magical glyphs called characteres, along with a few Greek letters and astrological signs, all structured around concentric circles partitioned into regular segments. No scholar really knows how this divination disc was used in Pergamum, I kind of imagine a Ouija board where the ritual expert's hand would float from letter to letter to try to gain an oracle. But nevertheless, we assume it was just part of the toolkit of ritual specialists in the city of Pergamum. So when thinking about ancient astrology and divination, it's better not to think about this, and rather think about this. 
But going back to our wise men from Matthew, ironically the three magi were pretty popular in early Christian magic as well. Take a look at this bronze amulet currently housed in the British Museum. On the front is a winged male god of some sort, holding scorpions and trampling crocodiles, surrounded by magical symbols. But on the other side, it is covered in New Testament imagery. We see God flanked by two angels, Jesus' miracle of turning water into wine, and right in the middle, a nativity scene with the shepherds and the three magi bringing their gifts to Jesus. Christians used amulets like this all the time to protect themselves from misfortune. And since ancient Christians believed demons to be everywhere, you would probably want some supernatural protection too. This particular amulet reads, Lord, do not give strength to my enemies for your right hand always protects me. The Magi appear in several protective magical contexts, both in late antiquity and the medieval period. Maybe it was because of the Magi's reputation for being ritual experts, or maybe it was because of their mysterious origins from the East but it seems that the ancient Christians had a pretty creative way to adapt and reuse the nativity story from the Gospel of Matthew. It really puts an interesting spin on the idea of the magic of Christmas. As always, thanks for watching and subscribing, and I'll see you next time.